We are live. I am Tom Nelson and we have Susan Crockford here. I'm very excited to talk to Susan about polar bears because uh, she's very knowledgeable. I've been following her on Twitter and on her blog for a long time. So Susan, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, Tom. I'm a zoologist with a PhD and a specialty in evolution. And I've been studying polar bears and Arctic animals since the 1990s. And until 2019, I was an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria for 15 years. And uh, have you been interested in the climate debate for a long time, or are you mostly just into polar bears and not into the climate so much? Not really into the climate stuff so much. It would I would see it come up in places and I would think, I really don't think this is a real issue, but I think it's going to go away. And so I ignored it. All right. Uh, it wasn't until it really started to hit polar bears. Yeah. That I really got interested because I had been studying the ecology and genetics and evolution of polar bears, as I said, since the 90s, partly in association with my PhD research. And so I was up on that literature. And when in 2007, yes. they were, the polar bear specialists were starting to make noises and wanted to get bears on the endangered species list, then I started to look into it. And what actually happened that really cemented that was that I belonged to a list serve for marine mammal biologists. Oh, yeah. And in that, there was a call for reviewers for a to review a summary document that was to be produced for the Library of Congress. Yeah. So this was meant to inform Congress about polar bear biology ahead of this decision so that they could make an informed decision. And I looked, I was tired. I think it was a Thursday afternoon and I was a little fed up. And so I responded to this fellow and I said, this is really a load of nonsense. Why are you bothering with this or something like that? And he responded back by saying, you're exactly the kind of person that I need to review this. I need somebody who's going to be critical. And he said, I'll put those documents in the mail right away. And so he did. And I actually sat down and spent three or four days going through it. And I'm happy to say that went from a three and a half page document to at least 11 pages. Oh. And it actually included a map, which it didn't have the first time around. Good. Which I thought was, you can't talk about the Arctic and not have the map. Nobody knows what you're talking about. But anyway, so that was my big contribution. And I realized then that that was... The, there was a place for me, a contribution I could make to this discussion about what was going on. Very interesting. Do you think that was the peak of the polar bear as an icon for the global warming world? Was it when Al Gore's movie came out? Or... That was 2007. So it yeah. was around then. So 2007 was when the application for the endangered status went in. And it wasn't confirmed until the next year. But in that period, 2006 to okay. 2000 and eight or nine in there, I think was peak. All right. And then have you been for a long time responding on social media whenever there's a crazy story about polar bears? Have you been blogging about that? No, I've been reading your stuff in response. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And it's just, I keep an eye on what's going on and keep my eye on stories in the news and people send me things if I miss yeah. them. And okay. thing to what I try and what I try and do is provide people with some background to a lot of these news stories. That, you know, for example, if you, if there's a polar bear attack and people are saying, oh, this is to do with lack of sea ice, mm -hmm. then what I'll do is provide a map again, okay. because uh -huh. most news stories won't provide that. So people don't know where they're talking about. I pull up the sea ice maps at the time the attack happened and those kinds of things. People can have, make a, an informed decision about what they think about those kinds of stories. I wanted to know also what percent of your focus is on polar bears versus like you do write about walruses. I don't know about seals or. I do because they're really all entwined and yeah. I became interested about 2014, mainly because of the rhetoric was, was winding up in the media about walrus. And, and yeah. so I hadn't really actually t to that time looked into it too much, but I dove into the literature and found that in fact, a lot of it was being either misrepresented or glossing over a lot of it, historical stuff. And I felt it was worthwhile spending some time on that as well. Very good. Can you take us through what you think has happened with the polar bear population since maybe the 1960s in terms of 
Are the numbers bigger and how accurate are the censuses, et cetera? The, there, there was the first kind of censuses were not really carried out, I don't think, until the 1980s that okay. were what we would call scientific and okay. you know, that they were based on maybe taking account of a small population and then extrapolating out. But what we know was happening in the 1960s was that governments around the Arctic were concerned about numbers because people who were hunting them were having trouble finding them. Okay. And it, it was clear there was a population decline. Certainly, Russia was the first. Russia actually banned hunting in 1956. Oh. They knew by that point yeah. that, that there was a problem in their country. And if you look at the map of the Arctic, Russia takes up a huge chunk of it. They were ahead of the curve in terms of that. So they got together in the late 60s and had discussions and yeah. decided to put together an international treaty and it was really the first of its kind to really try and moderate that kind of huge area. And so since then, the numbers have gone up. And we see that in the censuses, even the informal yeah. ones. By the time that we were getting into the 80s, it was clear, actually, from oh. that numbers had pretty much doubled. Right. That they thought, what the polar bear specialists thought there had been, they had doubled, and in fact, for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the island that okay. produces the red list of okay. endangered species, so they had they had listed them as threatened early on, and then they reduced that to least concern okay. in 1986, and they actually so polar bears were listed as least concern from 86 to 96. And most people don't know. And so that, that was, the bears had recovered in numbers and they were doing fine. And so it wasn't until about 2005 that the concern was raised again. Yeah. But really what I'm seeing in terms of what's going on with the numbers, monitoring each of the, the new studies that come out, is that the numbers are going up. As you would expect, if they were protected from overhunting since that was the primary cause of a decline in the first place. The most common natural cause of death for bears is starvation in yeah. any kind of a context because old bears can't eat. If they don't eat, they starve. It's just a natural thing. They don't have natural predators. And you would expect the population to go up once they were protected from hunting as we see in virtually all other marine mammal species, sea otters, yes. humpback whales, all kinds of other things. And it would be the expected thing to see. And it, they're not going up by huge amounts, depending on what numbers you believe, but there's definitely, as far as I can, there's definitely no evidence of an overall decline right. in, in recent years. Does anybody have any firm numbers at all about how many were hunted in the 1960s per year versus how many are hunted now per year? It really depends on the area. In some years, in the area of Svalbard, north of Norway, in some years, they were a thousand bears taken right. a year. One of the things that I've written about, which was surprising even to me, that I discovered that there was also a huge slaughter, period of slaughter, that was done by whalers oh, okay. in the late 1800s, early 1900s that okay. had to have taken out half the bears in the world. Okay. They were, they had run out of whales. And so they were going after bear skins oh. and things like walrus to actually make money because there were no whales. And so they did a okay. huge number, particularly in the Eastern Arctic, like up through Davis Strait and Baffin Bay, and okay. then around the Svalbard area. That was from about 1880 to the 1930s, and then again after the okay. war until about okay. the early 70s, there was another hit at them. So really, they've been hunted really heavily since the, say, middle of the 1800s. And the protection from overhunting was very definitely needed. All right. But to this day, I'm reading numbers like they can harvest 4% of the population. That's a sustainable harvest. And if they might be hunting hundreds of them per year right now, aren't they? Is that correct? Well, sir, I believe so in Canada. That's true. Yeah. It, it is one of those things that they do work out mathematically. That yeah. is, is what all hunting management is based yeah. on. And they do watch them in areas to make sure that the local population is not 
hit in any kind of dramatic way. But it does seem like if we actually want, if we want more polar bears, that the first thing we would st do is stop shooting them rather than to try to tweak CO2 in order Well, to uh, and, and certainly I can see that part of yeah. the argument, but the other side of it is that virtually all of the people that live in yeah. that part of the world are native Inuit. Oh, okay. And so, and they depend on polar bears yeah. as part of their yeah. traditional use. Yeah. And they need them not only for the fat and the food value, but for the skins. And one of the things that comes into this argument is the business of trophy hunting. Yes. Where the Inuit will take a Southern, an outsider, trophy hunting, hunting for a bear. But if I explain one of the things that happens mm -hmm. is that they manage the hunt by issuing hunting tags. Okay. So say for one village, there are three hunting tags given to this village and they can use that for their own local people or they can sell, choose to sell oh, it to an outsider. Okay. Right. okay? Yep. So if they use it for their village, for their own use, they have all year to hunt a bear. So they can use it whenever they want. They can wait until a bear walks into the village and so they don't even have to work very hard at it. But if they choose to sell it to an outsider, they they can pretty much demand whatever they want for it. They could okay. charge him $50,000 and okay. they can charge him that they have to pay for a guide and all kinds mm -hmm. of other things, money that goes into the community. But the other thing is that person from outside is likely, what, going to be hunting for a week? Yep. If he doesn't get a bear, that tag is dead. Oh. So it's out of use if it doesn't, if it doesn't get used during that time. And so, in fact, if all of the tags were kept within these communities, were, they would almost certainly be all used. Yep. Whereas if they're sold to outsiders, there is a really good chance that maybe even half of them actually okay. never get used. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not at all anti-hunting. I just yeah. think we're actually worried about the population. I think I don't, if they're saying that 4% is sustainable, then we can't be that worried that they're going to go extinct. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So sure. how, how close do you think we are to carrying capacity? Are there just enormous amounts of seals so that they could let the population double a couple more times? Or One of the, th the issues that comes up, and it's been clear that once there is less sea ice in summer, habitat that both seals and polar bears use is that first year ice that freezes yeah. and melts every year. Yeah. It's not the really thick ice in the middle of the Arctic. Yeah. But when you have less ice in the summer, there's more sunlight comes in, you get more phytoplankton in the water that, pr that produces more food for the fish, more fish for the seals, better fed that the seals are, the more productive they are, they give birth to healthier pups, more pups and healthier pups, which okay. means there's more food for the bears. And so it really looks like in those areas of the world, say north, north of the Bering Sea, in the Chukchi Sea, and in the Barents Sea, particularly that those are areas that have had a fairly dramatic decline in summer sea ice, but have yeah. also had a really large in this primary productivity. And to my mind, that explains why the bears are doing so well. Okay. It means that it's because in the spring, when they do most of their hunting and feeding, there are lots of seals for them to feed on. And as long as they're fat, when the summer comes, they don't care if they're sitting out in the middle of the Arctic on a nice yeah. hill or sitting on a beach somewhere. They just live off their fat. And they don't but have... My, my answer then is, yes, I see that. Yeah. And I think that I have I seen some of the Norwegian biologists say that they don't feel the Barents Sea Bears have actually hit capacity yet. And if we're looking in, say, Davis Strait, where they've got harp seals where there's millions of them to eat, I think yeah. that there's a very good chance that those numbers could easily double. All right. How long that would take, I don't yeah. know. But All right. And by the way, the hunting is done. Do they just shoot the old males when they do the hunting or is there any, or can they just shoot any? Oh, definitely. They're restricted. They're not allowed to hunt females with cubs. Right. And so, you know, it is a, it is restricted in that way in, in terms of the age and the sex thing. One of the things that comes up is that I think what we're seeing now in areas like Svalbard and areas of Russia is that we've had decades now of no hunting 
means mm -hmm. nobody is taking out the old. Now, the older males are dominant in their social system. And what they tend to do is beat up on the younger bears, especially younger males. And so when you see the young males that have just left their mother, they've just stopped nursing, and they have to be out and hunting for the first time, they kill a seal. Along comes this big old bear and just drags them off. So they have a real hard time. Those, okay. those young males getting enough to eat. And the more older bears you have in the population, it means you've got more, more okay. old bears picking on all the young bears. And okay. so the problems I think that we're seeing in a lot of areas recently in Russia in particular of the young bears coming into communities and getting into garbage and causing problems, that some of that is a repercussion of having this really skewed population. And it's just a consequence. It's, this is what you get and you're not hunting. And if that's what you want, then that's yeah. what you have to accept and deal with. But some of the people who live there want more control of the bully bears, don't they? For well, they safety? certainly seem yeah. to get frustrated when they're yeah. not permitted to yes. deal with the bears when they become particular problems up close and personal. Okay. Yeah. But when we hear these stories that there's so many bears around town, we're constantly told that it's because there's no sea ice, so they have to be around town. But maybe it's because there's actually a lot of bears around. Or I don't there's know. a lot of bears. Yeah. And, and that's what I've looked at the, the Western Arctic a few okay. years ago in February where they had 50 or 60 bears coming oh. in to the dump and then the bears oh, yeah. would go into town as well. I looked at the sea ice and it's just like, there there were similar conditions years before that, but no okay. problems with the bears. And oh. so it's a combination of things. I think it's increasing bear numbers, but also the fact that they're, they're not allowed to chase them off and they're providing easy food. Yeah. And we have problems with black bears down yes. south here. If you've got an open dump, you're asking for trouble with bears and other animals. I had a black bear about 20 feet from my office a couple months ago for the first time in, in 20 years, but unrelated. I wanted to ask, polar bears, do you think they've been around a couple hundred thousand years? I've been looking closely at that question for the last few months, and it's tricky because we've got fossil evidence yeah. Which, like the oldest fossil, is something like 125,000 years okay. old. And the, where we know that they came from, they evolved from brown bears. The oldest known brown bear fossil is 660,000 years old. All right. So we've got some kind of a constraint in terms of fossils. There have been, oh, over a dozen genetic studies that have tried to pinpoint exactly when and where all this happened. And their numbers are all over the place. They're everywhere from 2 million years ago to 140,000. My guess would be in the 400,000 range oh, oh. as the most reasonable explanation. And so quite, yeah. quite a number, a, a fair amount of time. So we're pretty sure that they lived through both warm periods and cold periods. Oh, absolutely. And that's the critical thing. And we keep getting the mesh because of this whole emphasis on climate change that it's warm periods with less summer ice that would be the most catastrophic to polar bears. But I don't think they've really, any of those people have looked into how devastating it had to have been during okay. glacial times. Yeah. Because during glacial times, the whole of the central Arctic basin would have had such thick ice that nothing could have lived there. Like okay. not, certainly not bears or seals. So they would have been pushed out, like their whole population would have been separated out into the North Atlantic, out into the North Pacific, to the seasonal ice that would have formed around the edges there. They okay. would have had to live there for 10 or 20,000 years. And then when it all melted, they all came back together. So they were doing okay. this back and forth and back and forth. And they've been through that several okay. times. All right. Have any fossils of polar bears ever been found far from what we think where the sea was, or were they always somewhere near the sea? As far no, as you know? well, the interesting thing is that there's very few fossils for that okay. thing. Yeah. And the, there was a, a recent one that was the focus of a new paper that was found on the coast of Alaska, yeah. on the coast of the Beaufort Sea. And then the oldest one is from Svalbard. And that's 120,000. Right. And there's a few others that are around the north coast of Norway. And then, and those are the only okay. old ones that are, say, older than, say, 15,000 years. 
And then there is a group of them that are in southern Sweden, Norway, Denmark, that Baltic area, that are between 10 and 13,000 years old. And that was a cold period that came at the after the end of the Ice Age, things started to warm up, and then yeah. it got cold again. So that period stared to us the Younger Dryas. And so that pushed ice down to that area of southern Scandinavia. And virtually all of those fossil remains are come from that time period. And just a few thousand years, they were there, and then they were go. Very interesting. I guess those are the only unusual ones, really. All right. We get these scare stories all the time that, oh no, polar bears are doing stuff that they never did before. Like they killed a caribou or they ate some goose eggs or they, well, I don't know what else they did, but I'm thinking that they must've been doing this stuff off and on for a hundred, couple hundred thousand years. Don't you think? Or, yeah, why absolutely. Not? Yeah. The thing is that these bears are, and all bears are opportunistic and yeah. they're curious and they're always looking for food. So that's one thing. Yeah. But the other thing that's going on is that they're comparing maybe what was happening in the 60s and 70s yes. with what's happening now and leaving out the part that there's more caribou in these places now than yeah. there were when yeah. studies were done before. Yes. There's yeah. more geese now than there were yeah. before yeah. and all of those things. The same thing with eating bird's eggs. Yeah. If okay. It's the same phenomenon if you look into what's been happening with those animals that they're said to be eating, what is an explosion of their population. So all of a sudden they're just, they're more easily available. And of course they're going to go after them if they have a chance. All right. And then how about the same deal with sometimes there's a hybrid maybe between a grizzly bear and a polar bear. Uh, right? Like, and that's been a lot of fun. Oh. So that's, and there's been a lot of mileage that has been gotten out of that, but that started back in 2006 when and this was, again, an Inuit hunter out with an outsider with a hunting tag. He had a tag for a polar bear. And they, he shot what he thought was a polar bear. When they got up close, oh. they realized it had the long claws of a grizzly, the hump. And he was a little concerned that yeah. he was going to get clipped for killing a grizzly because he didn't have a grizzly tag. Now, you have to remember that grizzlies actually, even in that, especially in that part of the world, in, in that part of Alaska, can be quite blonde. Like there is a blonde grizzly, which is a natural color. And some of these hybrids are a dirty white. Like it, it can create a kind of a confusing thing. Anyway, the specimens were sent off and it turned out it was a hybrid okay. between a female polar bear and a male grizzly. And in the course of the next, what it was, eight years until 2014, there were a number of other hybrids oh. seen or shot and recorded. And anyway, somebody finally wrote a paper, like summarizing what had happened. And okay. it turned out it was one polar bear female was Did started you? all this. Oh, She mated with okay. two different right. grizzly males, one of her female offspring from the one male mated with her father all right. to produce more. And so it went. And so it meant that all of it, it was it within one family, basically, okay. within these three bears. And eventually, and I think her last litter, the one who back crossed to her father, she had a litter of triplets, but they were all male. It's unlikely if that would have continued. And some of them were shot and it's just, but it just ended. At that it did end. I was going to ask. It, it, it ended. And so it hasn't yeah. continued. And when I was looking at the details of it, it really seemed that what, there, there is an overlap in breeding time between the two species. To really find the right combination, you would have to have an early breeding yeah. with a really late breeding polar oh, okay. bear for it to work. And my guess is if this female polar bear was such a late breeder, it's likely she could never find oh, a mate when she okay. was ready. Because she was yeah. breeding so late, none of the polar bears were ready for her at that point. Okay. And, and in fact, I was like, I can't remember the age, but she was like 14 or something when she had her first known hybrid litter. And we don't know if she had any other litters, but if that was her first, it yeah. meant that she went without breeding for all that time. Wow. About how old can they get, say, in the wild reasonably? Well, there's, there are some that have been known to live until they're about 30. That would be for females. Males 
less than that, but certainly you can get them into their 20s these days for sure. Could the females still have cubs into their 20s or would they stop? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll probably start declining. They might yeah. have triplets at the height of the yeah. reproductive at their okay. prime and then okay. have twins and then go down to singletons. But all right. Uh, how rare is it in the wild just for a grizzly bear to even encounter a polar bear if they're just walking around throughout the year? Is that something that? Well, really, no. And that's the other thing is that the context of all this is that the male grizzlies were going, they were coming from the Canadian Arctic tundra. So the mainland of Canada and wandering up north over the ice to where the polar bears live because and this is in March and April. So it's okay. when the when it's all covered in ice. So they're using the ice as a bridge to get up where the polar bears are living. And what they found is that some of them actually just go to follow around behind polar bears okay. to clean up their, their seal kills. And and some of them have even learned how to kill the seals themselves. If they I expect that if they saw a bear killing a seal, they would get the idea that this is yeah. what needs to be done. But what happens is that the, the grizzlies hibernate, like they all hibernate in the winter, but in the spring, the males come out first. So they're coming out first in the spring and spring in the Arctic is still frozen snow everywhere. Okay. So yeah. they're wandering around looking for food and they're, they can wander thousands of kilometers apparently. And really? uh, they're one of the longest wandering bears known these okay. tundra these tundra grizzlies so it's not a question of polar bears having to move into grizzly territory in fact it's entirely uh -huh. opposite it has nothing to do with sea ice uh -huh. in any way except for the fact that the grizzlies are using the ice okay. to get into okay. polar bear territory and again the original polar bears just they were grizzly bears that wandered out there and uh, they somehow became polar bears. They became well, yeah, or... and that's, I've written about this before and, you know, what it looks like th that if you think about it, polar bears are Arctic adapted. So we're thinking a glacial situation, a situation where you've got ice sheets coming, where if uh, grizzlies are living on a plot of land, you've got ice sheets coming down and pushing oh, them, oh. constraining them. Yeah. And if there's sea ice offshore, the bears that are the lands that their habitat starts to shrink, they have a problem. They have to compete then for okay. horses with a smaller area. So they have a choice of whether to stay and fight for the resources they know or to go out on the sea ice and see what's out there. And if it's spring, they go out there and find their seals. They yeah, can yeah. stay. And if we look at that kind of a situation where it really is a choice. It's a choice that they can make under that stressful situation. And I think it comes down to the basic physiology of the bear, the bears that choose to go out and colonize this new habitat and that you get the kind of changes wow. that happen during speciation because you're separating the population based on those physiological, hormonal, as well as genetic components, and that you can then get a new, a new form popping up quite quickly, actually. And okay. without going into tremendous amounts of detail, that's okay. really the explanation. And it's what we think happened during, say, dog domestication, the similar thing that okay. you would have had people in their first camps where they were instead of moving all over the landscape, they were settled down into a village. And so they were bringing, they were still hunting. So they were bringing all their stuff home. And there, so there was all kinds of garbage, things to eat. You had wolves sitting outside that landscape, attracted to that new resource, but some, most of them afraid, right? Yeah. Afraid of the uh, uh, of people. Yeah. And so what you get are only the animals who were relatively fearless about being close to people who were actually attracted. And that okay. because it selected for those particular types of animals, you created a kind of new subset that then interbred yeah. and you get a separation of the population that way. Do you think that dogs were domesticated in like hundreds of places around the world as independently or were they just- did they Not hundreds, that? not hundreds, yeah. but I think it's very likely that it could have happened two or three places. Oh, okay. And it could have happened also a few times 
but never quite taken that it started, but never yeah, okay. quite got there kind of thing. It's really the genetics of the dog domestication are as complicated as the polar bear stuff, which is why I'm interested yeah. in it because okay. they really are parallel problems. All right. I was going to ask, is a big polar bear uh, quite a bit bigger than the big grizzly in terms of weight? Or I guess, I don't know about that. A couple quite of... it, uh, it depends on your, what, how you define yeah. bigger, I think, right. because yeah. my understanding is that grizz or polar bears are slightly taller, like taller okay. to the shoulder yeah. okay. and longer and a bit longer. Yes. And, and it may be that if you're, you could probably get, you get a big male grizzly who's big and fat, well-fed, yeah. okay. might be yeah. heavy than a big bear, polar bear. But okay. some of the really big polar bears are running 14, 1500 pounds. And wow. they're really fat at that size. I have one other unrelated thing. My dad just mentioned today that he heard of a white black bear population. Have you heard of that? There's a population somewhere? Read, yeah, it's not quite, they call it a spirit bear. Is it? That it's up on the central coast of British Columbia here. And what it is a, it's the, a white phase okay. black bear. Like you can get brown face, brown yeah. colored black yeah. bears. So these are white colored black bears that can actually like a mother can have a black cub and a white one. And she can be white herself and give birth to white ones. All right. Kind of thing. And so it's not a whole population of them. So okay. it's just, it's like the color phases. But yeah. there, it tends to crop up more in this one population than elsewhere. And so uh, that's why they're, they've designated it as a special area. I okay. don't see the significance okay. myself. Okay. But, but for them, it's not an adaptation to any sort of a white background? Like No, it doesn't seem to be at all. like that. How do they do the polar bear census right now? This year, what's the process to try to figure out how many polar bears are out there? Recently... They've been doing, most of the surveys have been done by air, which is something that used to be poo-pooed as not a very good method. They're coming to realize that it's less invasive. You don't have to capture the bears. Okay. You can get it done in a shorter period of time and it's much less expensive. And I don't know if there, there may actually be a census of Western Hudson Bay bears going on this summer. But then it takes them years to actually come out with the numbers and it's very frustrating because yeah. by the time you actually see the studies, because I think they've finished one in Davis Strait in 2019 and they haven't been able to go out in the field because of COVID and we still haven't got the report yet. Okay. It's just like how, and then by the time you've got the report, it's virtually out of date. Like it, okay. it's frustrating in that respect. Do you think uh, that really what they're doing is they're counting the, the bears that they can see and yeah. then kind of trying to come up with a mathematical model to try and estimate how many bears okay. are out there that they don't see. And so it's, and if you go back through time, virtually every estimate that's been generated has used a different method yeah. and a different model. So it's like comparing them is really like, what do you do? It's hard. You either take them at face value or throw them all out the window. Yeah. It's, it's a crapshoot. It becomes for me, particularly suspect when we've got some of the populations that they're insisting are declining yes. and they come up with these real, these statistical methods nobody's ever heard of, nobody's ever used before. And they say, ta-da, they're declining. And it's, uh, yeah, I'm really convinced. Yeah. Do you think there's any reluctance to release numbers that are too positive? Because it does. Oh, for sure. sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And because in any time you catch any of them, having to admit uh -huh. that the bears are doing now, they say, uh -huh. like, just yeah. wait, it's just. <laughs> Like they have to throw it in there. It's all doomsday is coming. So are you really plugged into the community in terms of finding out what they really think in terms of the polar bear experts? What percent of them are really convinced that the polar bear numbers are declining? It's really, it's yeah. hard because they're, I've been at it so long now that they're, they've got their guard up. They won't yeah. really talk to me, okay. but look for places where they're talking candidly and look for those kinds of things. It seems to me that some of the Norwegian biologists, I probably shouldn't say this and just get them into trouble, but that they are at least being forthcoming about what's happening up there. And really they are unique within their community 
in the sense that they go up every spring and do an assessment and they look at how many, how many cubs there are. They weigh the bears and do all of these things in a consistent way every year. And they post the data online every year so you can see it. And they deserve an immense amount of credit for that because it's not showing yeah. everything going into the toilet. And yeah. it should be going into the toilet because that particular part of the world has had the greatest decline in sea ice in the summer yeah. any place in the Arctic. So if any place okay. should be showing a pronounced response to lack of sea ice, it should be there and it's not happening. When they talk to the media, they say all the right things, but they do their monitoring every year and they post their data for the world to see. Good for them. Yeah. So you don't have to wait. Why okay. should you have to wait in this right. day and age for yeah. a big fancy report? These things are not complicated. They're shown that. Yeah. How big of a deal is predation of the bears uh, against their own cubs? Oh, I don't think it's a big deal. And it's certainly something that happens not only in bears, but in all kinds of things, even fish. There's a lot of fish that are oh. cannibalistic. They oh, yeah. eat their own kind. Yeah. And it's been blamed on all kinds of things, but really it's more often to be adult males and that'll go after the cubs. And some people say that it's to, to that it will bring the female back into heat. If he does that, which is true at certain times of year, but if you get it happening in like late summer and fall, which there certainly are documented incidents of that, there, there's no way that's happening. The bears aren't in breeding condition at that time. It just is, it is something that happens and I okay. think it, it goes to their level of aggression and their place in the dominance hi hierarchy. I'm curious as to how big a polar bear needs to get before it doesn't really need to worry about predation anymore. Some of the females, I've seen males go after females with cubs and they fight back. It just, I think, depends on how tenacious the male decides to be. And often what they'll do is just keep at her until she runs. And if she runs, the cub invariably falls behind and that's when he gets them. So he's not really confronting directly. He okay. tries to make her run so that he can get the cub when it's running. All right. And, but we, you know, what we also see, and there are a few places where you get grizzlies and polar bear meeting up with each other yeah. on land mm -hmm. in the fall, particularly on the coast of Alaska in say the, in late summer where the, where they've got the bone piles of the whales that were oh, hunted yeah. by the Aboriginal communities there. And so the bears are attracted into these, to these bone piles. But what's interesting is that you see the real dominance coming out, the difference in bear behavior between the polar bears and the brown bears. The polar bears are bigger, but in okay. fact, the brown bears are much more aggressive. Oh. And so they have documented instances of like quite small female grizzlies chasing off male oh. polar bears twice her size. And in fact, they say that if there are polar bears on the bone pile and a grizzly is just approaching, they all leave. Like okay. they don't even, they don't want nothing to do with a grizzly. So that there, there is a real big difference in their behavior. Very interesting. What's the largest number of polar bears you've heard of just being at one site? Isn't there's tens of them sometimes is that near, isn't that true on some dumps? I thought I've seen pictures of just ridiculous numbers of polar bears. Oh, yeah. Well, I think in some of the Russian cases, they've had the numbers vary 60, 70 That's time cool. kind yeah. of thing. And, and what was the other one? No, it was the whale carcass. I think it was 2019. There yeah. was pictures of a whale washed up on a beach in Russia and it was, it was a tourist boat was going by and there were hundreds really? of bears okay. congregated. And they actually, they look like sheep coming down, down the hill onto this whale at the beach, but they were all, but because it was that time of year out of the breeding season that they don't mind being close together at that time. All right. Yeah, I have a couple of high profile incidents I wanted to ask you about. One of them was the, I don't know if it was 15 years ago or something. There's some story about a plane flying over and seeing some drowned polar bears after a storm. Do you know about that one? I think they saw yeah. things, but they didn't yeah. even check for sure whether they were even polar bears. They saw something that they thought was a drowned polar bear. 
I don't know if you have any, any insight. In I'm just trying to remember yeah. what the details are. And yeah. if I'm remembering correctly, that was around 2004, 2005. Okay, all right. But it was critical because it was information that was included in this petition to have okay. the bears all listed right. as threatened. It was one of those things where, you know, they were doing a survey from the air, thought they saw two floating carcasses of polar bears in the water and what but what they did was extrapolated that for the whole coast and that so they came up with this number uh, 11 or something like that right. and where in fact they had never seen 11 it right. was just they assumed if there was two there must have been 11 over the whole coast but it was something like that and it was the fact that there, it was the large number that was yeah. getting the attention and the, they were saying that these were bears that had drowned because of storms and that the waves had killed them because there was no ice. And okay. that was the logic behind it. But in fact, they had never confirmed that these were actually right. bears in the first place or that they had actually died by drowning rather than being shot or something like that. It wasn't the confirmation that you would be wanting for the amount of attention that it got. All right. How far can they swim? Oh, hundreds you know? of miles, actually. Yeah. So they're be... really strong swimmers. Yeah. It's, it is. And even the young bears that are only six months old or so are pretty good swimmers too. Yeah. And I think it's mind blowing that they can swim hundreds of miles. Yes. No, absolutely. And, and the, one of the things that's cool that I've seen is really little cubs that are like three or four months old. They climb up on their mother's back and basically sit on her shoulders and hold okay. onto her head. Like okay. you put a little kid on your shoulders yeah. and they just sit up there while she swims. It's okay. it really, it's crazy. And, so then uh, they might be able to travel a hundred miles that way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What did you think of the uh, Al Gore footage, computer generated footage of a polar bear trying to get up on a, the ice? Yeah. That, so wasn't it? It was, he's trying to use it and he's trying to make a point. But as I said, that was the period when they were all hyped up on this stuff and really trying to push it all through. Yeah. There's been actually a couple of other high profile photos. Isn't there one of a polar bear uh, like clinging to some actual ice? I don't know if you remember seeing that one. There's a chunk of ice that's pretty thin and it's uh, holding on. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And in fact, it was just because they climb up on these, their bits of glaciers and things like that, but the bears climb up on them all the time. And so they, it was presented as this bear clinging to the last vegetation of ice to save his life when in fact, yeah. if the bigger picture of it was there was ice all around, you just didn't see it yeah. at yep. the time. So yep. it was misused. It was misrepresented. And I think there was a high profile picture or maybe a National Geographic picture of a very emaci emaciated bear. Yeah. Yeah. The, the big starving, starving polar bear story. Yeah. And, but I mean, that one was another, another big hype job. And again, I ended up having to dive into that fray to, to point out that if the bear had been starving because of lack of sea ice. There would have been hundreds of them. Yes. Like if that had been the case, yes. there would have been hundreds, not one. And as it turned out, this was a photographer who'd spent weeks looking for something yeah. like yeah. that, uh -huh. found what he wanted, used it, and he was trying to make a point and he yeah. made his point. It was nothing but a, a natural phenomenon, a bear that was dying of starvation because he was sick or ill. And the real thing that kind of got me in the end was they just let him swim away oh. like they, and they never contacted any authority okay. to let them know he should have been euthanized in the state he was in yeah. or at least the local authorities contacted so that they knew to warn people because this was the area where Inuit live. They go out hunting all around areas during the summer. That's what they do. And you could have had somebody in there camping. Mm -hmm. He would have climbed up there and slaughtered people because yeah. it's those really hungry bears who are dangerous. Yeah. And even in that kind of a state, they're powerful enough to kill. But but that was how it ended. They got their film foot yeah. and let the bear swim away and never told anyone because they wanted their exclusive and didn't want anyone yeah. to know about it. But it seems like that must be the way that a lot of the polar bear uh, lives end eventually. If they live long enough, they probably just can't hunt at the very end. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because if they can't hunt, sometimes it can be like a broken tooth, something yeah. like that, or an injured foot. If they can't swim, if they can't hunt, they can't eat. And they have to be able to put on the weight to yeah. get them through both the summer and the winter. And 
it's just an unfortunate phase of their life. But eventually they get to the point where they're so old, they're not strong enough. Maybe they yeah. get beat up or again with the big males. Once they get old and the big males start coming and taking their kills away from them. Yeah. And they're not strong enough to oh, defend them. All right. Things like that. All right. Which ones hibernate or how do they pass the long winter up there when there's no sunlight at all? Some hibernate and some don't, or what is the deal? Yeah, the only pregnant females hibernate. So they make dens in the fall and their cubs are born over the winter. And when they come out in the spring, okay. cubs are already about three months old. Okay. And then all of the rest of them are out on the sea ice. Presumably, okay. Hunt, but nobody studied them yeah. out there. There's no winter studies because it's dark and it's cold. Okay. So nobody really knows what they're doing, but it looks like a lot of them probably like in, in the darkest part of the winter, they probably make like a shelter. They make themselves a shelter and hunker down for the worst kind of the weather. So are there seals out there that where there's no open water for miles, but they just have a breathing hole or I don't know how far away the seals go? Well, you, on, if you get into the areas where the ice is really thick, no, yeah. they're not. But, okay. but what you do get is like all of that ice is all the time is what you have to remember. And that when it starts to move, if it's even if it's solid ice, if it starts to move, it cracks. So okay. As soon as it cracks. Yeah. The seals can make breathing holes in that ice. Like it's so cold usually if the ice cracks and then it skims over and freezes really quickly, but they okay. can, they can keep the, keep that open. Okay. So there's areas like they can happen. And then in thinner ice, they just keep, they drill holes in the ice with their claws and their teeth and they keep them open okay. in the winter. All right. No, it's a, an interesting sort of coexistence that the two of them can. Yep. And a polar bear can smell a seal how far away, do you think? Oh, yeah, I don't know. A long, I've a heard long, a long way. They've way. got a really, yeah. really good sense of smell. All right. And the next question I had was about the uh, David At Attenborough thing and the walrus stampede. Did you I... write a book about that? Or... Yes, I no. did. Yeah, I thought yes, you I did. did. Yeah. Yes, I can. Here, let me do my promotion. Next. Absolutely. There, there it is. My, there's my book. It's called <laughs> Fallen Icon. Excellent. David Attenborough and the Walrus Deception. But that comes out of the movie documentary that he narrated yeah. and called Our Planet. So it had seven or eight episodes okay. that, that was partnered with Netflix. But what most people don't realize that is that World Wildlife Fund was a major oh. partner in this whole endeavor. I didn't and that David Attenborough has been a huge supporter of World Wildlife Fund his entire life. And so they got together in 2015 and cooked up this plan to put the series together. But part of it was a scene where walruses had climbed to the top of a cliff in Russia, just north of the Bering Strait. And they, they were showing in the film these walruses just falling off. The cliff right. flattering to yes. the deaths on the rock, Horrible. bouncing off the rocks. And yep. it was a really horrifying footage. Yep. And people were understandably upset. And I had, I looked at it and I thought that they're blaming it on lack of sea ice. And yep. I thought that doesn't even sound reasonable. So all it took was to Google a little bit. And I actually found a, an article by the Siberian Times, written by the Siberian Times, that showed that here was an incident almost identical oh. in nature to what they were showing that had happened in the fall of 2017. Like they never said when it happened, when all this uh, had happened. Uh, and they were describing these all hundreds of walruses falling off the cliff, but they also included in their story the fact that there was 20 or so polar bears who uh, in fact uh, were basically driving them off the cliff, which wasn't in the documentary. So it actually blew up. It was in a way that I hadn't anticipated because my, because I was accusing David Attenborough of being complicit in this whole thing. One of the, I guess the science editor at the Telegraph and the okay. UK newspaper actually wrote an article about this and she wasn't particularly taking my side, but it, it meant that it got a lot, it got a lot of traction in the mainstream media. Okay. And it, it was really interesting trying to really unravel all of the ins and outs and of what they'd done. 
and we thought we'd finally figured it out. And then it turns out the, so that the film came out in April, I think, of 2019. And in the fall, BBC had another documentary that Attenborough was narrating. And they showed footage, like drone footage, of these bears Pitch. facing the walruses off the cliff. They were at the same cliffs, the same walruses. Really? They didn't care that they were lying the first time. Oh. Just, oh. Anyway, so what I go into in my book was trying to put together, like, why they were lying. Why did they feel it was a lie? What was the real purpose of having that film footage? And because... What we know is that particular villain is one where they've had trouble with polar bears for several years. And so they've come, it's gotten media attention for the polar bears, not the walruses. So they're, what ends up happening is that the bears come in to feed on the walruses and then they get into the village. And so the village has trouble with bears on a okay. regular basis. Hmm. The World Wildlife Fund pays for their bear guides, the people specifically trained to help keep the community safe, means that World Wildlife Fund has people in there. They've wow. had people there since 2007. So they've known about this phenomenon for a long time. And anyway, there right. clearly was a lot of very careful planning and collusion, I think, that went on in the process of all of this. And it, I don't think Edinburgh doesn't really come off very well in this. It's really hard for me to understand how he could yeah. watch the film and narrate it, say the words. Right. In the one film, six months later, he's saying something else. And is he not putting it in together in his own mind that yeah. those are the same things? And it's no. like some of the footage is exactly the same. And David has admitted that. But what was he thinking? And yeah. I'm looking at what he's doing in that period in terms of his promotion of the whole climate ch change agenda. And that's where it starts to make sense. And if you look at all of the other documentaries that he's made since then, it really starts to make sense because they were pushing for a huge result at the climate change meeting in, in Edinburgh. Yeah. And that's what they, that's what they were building up to was trying to get yeah. Some things changed then. Yeah. So I would dearly think of Attenborough as just a kindly old grandpa that's so out of it that he's being used by other people, but it sounds like that's probably not the case that he had to have known. Well, and I, yeah, and because yeah. I've, I've listened to and I quote in my book, some of the interviews he's had with people where he really seems like way on board with the yeah. World Economic Forum yes. agenda on how we should be scaling things back, that yep. there's too many people and yep. all yep. of these things. If he, if that's his, if that's his own personal feeling, and I can see where at the end of his life, yep. he's 96 now, yep. that, that he's going to be pushing for the things that he really believes in. And that what we were seeing in that whole fiasco was his true beliefs coming up yeah and maybe he thinks that bending the truth a little bit for the greater good is probably yeah you know, i don't know yeah. yeah and it's they were looking to really influence powerful people yes and yeah. the information that i have is that they showed that clip from the movie of the walruses falling at the 2019 meeting of the world economic forum oh, okay. before the movie ever came out Really? All right. Wow. So he was aiming at the big movers and shakers. And all he had to, it was a hugely emotional. Yep. Like yep. it was more so even, I think, than the starving polar bear one. Yep. yep. And he knew he had dynamite with mm -hmm. that and he wanted to use it. But uh, your pushback got a lot of views and yep. a lot of people heard about your pushback. So that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And as I said, yeah. it's not all I'm doing is pushing for that. These are the facts of the biology. Stop screwing with yes. and misrepresenting what's going on for your own agenda. Did you want to tell us at all about collaring polar bears? I'm interested in the fact that they can't put collars on all of them, right? It doesn't work. Yeah. So what happens is that for male bears, their necks are actually wider than their heads. So if they put a collar on, it would just slip off. So okay. they can't put a collar on a male and they can't put collars on young bears 
because their necks get bigger as they grow and they get too, they can grow out of the collar too fast. But right. they only put collars on adult females. And so we've got, it means that over the last few decades, there's some good data on where the females go and what they do, but not so much on the adult males or the young animals. And what they've, what they're doing now is using apparently ear tags that work probably not as well or for as long, because I think they're easier for the bears to get off. They can just pull them off if they're, if it's bothering them, but they are, do seem to be getting some information from the young bears and the adult males that with the modern technology, can they just track them in real time as they're walking around? Oh yeah, I believe so. Yeah. And they okay. can tell for some of them have sensors. They can put sensors on them so they can tell when they're diving. They don't use those all the time, but they can put in okay. sensors that they can tell when they're diving and when they're above water and that kind of thing. So to see how much they're actually swimming and that kind of thing. I'm curious in the modern world, are they shooting a lot of them with tranquilizer darts? Like we used to see on the old wildlife shows, is that a thing that's done a lot still? Tranquilize them? They, in, in some areas they do. So they, in virtually all the areas of Canada that are de designated as Nunavut, so that is Aboriginal territory for the Inuit, they have objected so strenuously to tranquilizing the bears. They won't give the scientists permits. Oh. They have their own government. And so the way that they're stopping it is they refuse to give them permits to do this. And so it means it's one of the reasons why they're switching over to doing these aerial tents okay. where they go yeah. and, and do stuff from the air. But certainly they do tranquilize in Alaska and yeah. in Norway and in Western Hudson Bay, okay. as that happens to be not in Nunavut, but in Manitoba. So they get away with doing it there in, in that area. But they're also doing, doing some, not tranquilizing, but they're darting from the air. So they're getting close enough yeah. to shoot darts at the bear, which just takes a small sample that they can use for DNA. Oh. So it doesn't tranquilize the bears bear. It just sticks in for a minute and then oh. goes out. So the bear runs off and then they land the helicopter oh, okay. and pick up the dart to, as a way to get information on individuals within a population. That's yeah. one of the reasons why some of these new surveys are taking so long because they've got this, all of this genetic data and it's a oh. bit more complicated to okay. analyze. But at the same time, they could put out the basic stuff that they have pretty soon, I think. So that's how they figured out that whole uh, roller bear thing you're talking about, uh, who was related to who, they had all the DNA in it. They could figure out who was related to who, that story you were talking about earlier. Well, well in that oh. story, they actually had samples from, they were tranquilized, either oh, okay. shot or tranquilized bears. Oh, all right. And then when people object to the uh, tranquilizing, is it because it's dangerous to the bears or what's their objection? That they claim that it is, that it's hard for the bear, the scientists disagree. They say they've got studies showing that it really doesn't affect the bear, but some of the Inuit have said that, that they have seen bears get into trouble, that they can drown, that the drug doesn't wear off fast enough. But the, one of the main things is that the, if they're using that bear for me, oh. the drug stays in the system for a fair amount of time. And mm. so there is a concern about actually tainted meat. And that aspect of it, there's that concern as well. But they're powerful enough. They've got their own government. They're powerful enough. And they said no, and they were able to stop them, which I think is a good thing. If you have anything else you'd like to add or sum up anything, talk about your books, whatever, the floor is yours. There's things coming up. One of the things coming up these days is the use of models. And yeah. the, it's an aspect of the science that's used to study polar bears that I find particularly frustrating. Yeah. There, there's all this modeling going on, and now we're seeing it in other places, and we see it in all of it that's being used for climate change, and now we're seeing it for COVID, where right. there, there's all of this really exaggerated threat being shown by models, and it's coming down to this really common theme of yeah. so many, there's people out there that are saying, oh, some models are useful for certain things. I'm beginning to feel that in fact, models aren't useful, mm -hmm. they're dangerous. They may have once been useful, but they yeah. have been misused for so long now by so many people 
that they just are flat out dangerous. And it's when people ask me, what's the take home message to people? What is it that you need? What is it that you need to help inform yourself to make a decision about what's going on with these issues? I've got two, two things. One is don't forget history because that's something in all of these issues comes up time and time again. People are trying to either brush the history aside or change it. So yep. don't forget to look at the history okay. yeah. and never trust a model. Model is not evidence. A model is not a fact. The model result is not a fact. And it's not what we use traditionally in science to do our decision making. And I think modeling has corrupted so much decision making that we are really at risk of losing the important things that science is about. So in the climate world, I'm hearing uh, Gavin Schmidt talk about 1 million lines of Fortran. I don't know how old it is to try to model the Earth's climate. But is there something in the polar bear world that there's, have you seen like hundreds of thousands of lines of code where they're trying to figure out polar bear facts or? No, polar bear? no because that's not how they do it. How do they do Really? It? The ones, the models that are the most damaging are these ones where they're trying to predict what's okay. going to happen in the, yeah. in the yeah. but dissecting the ones that they made, first of all, like back in 2007, yeah. they were less sophisticated in that, okay. in that day. And they were trying to make a case to have the bears listed up, yeah. right on the endangered species list. But what they did was used a kind of model that uses one person's opinion as if those opinions were facts. Yes. I just find that yes. boggling yes. as a traditional yes. scientist yeah. that there would even be such a model. Mm -hmm. But what they did was he was the most senior polar bear expert and he thought bears need sea ice in summer yes. in order to live. Yes. Bears need this much ice. Bears need this. Bears need that. It turned out he was wrong. And that's the problem with opinions. Now, the, and the thing is, he was, he was going on the best knowledge he had at the time. So we haven't, he hadn't seen how bears responded to much yeah. reduced levels yeah. of ice. Yes. So he didn't know. He was guessing. And that's fine. He was making his best guess. When he turned when it turns out that he's wrong, yes. he should be able to say, I was wrong. Let's look at it again. And that's something that he has refused to do. Very interesting. Yeah. That's the problem. And when all of these guys go and talk to the media. And what they're doing is stating opinions or model results as if they're facts. And that's the problem is that we're getting those things out there to the public. The public is being inundated with this information that's tainted by all of this stuff. And that's why I think my blog is so sorely needed. Yeah. I've been told flat out by a prominent journalist that all of the journalists read my blog. Nice. Glad to hear that. And I see the result. I see something I said, they're not quoting me, but I see a fact gets changed here, a phrase thing here or there. They pick it up because they know I'm diving deep into the stuff and that wow. I do at least coverage of it and they know they'll get the picture. You know, it, I know I'm, I know I'm having an influence and that really in the bigger picture of the whole climate change discussion, I think the, for the general public, the whole polar bear issue is much more important than many people think. Yes. Yeah. And that's because it's an aspect, it's a subtopic of the whole issue that non-scientists, lay public, can get their he heads around. The num there's not com complicated numbers. It's stuff that makes sense to them. And if it's presented clearly that they can see, you know, if I say, here's what this guy is saying in 2021, what was he saying in 1979? Yeah. Let's go back and look at what yeah. he was saying in 1979. And so I give them the history and that it, what they can then see, they can see for themselves, the parallels between what's going on in the bigger climate picture. You don't have to beat them over the head with it. 
they see it. Yeah. When they see somebody else saying models are wrong or models tell us this, that, and the other thing, they'll remember, oh, but the polar bear models were wrong. So yeah. it really is a, an important component of it. And I think it's why I get beat up so much. Like the, that it's not only as journalists that come after me, but the cli climate scientist, Michael Mann, and yeah. all of the polar bear guys are bad mouthing me all the time to journalists. But it's because I am so effective at getting that information to the general public in a way that they can digest. Yeah. Is that generally your attitude that you are telling the truth and let the chips fall where they may because it's so important to tell the truth? That's the impression I'm getting. I think it's yeah. fantastic. No, well, really, it's just, yeah. and if I'm wrong, I'm prepared to say I'm wrong. Yes. Yeah. And it's, that's, it is part of the thing. And it irritates me to see yeah. other biologists who were trained under the same system that I was behaving with less integrity for those kinds of things, yes. you know, yeah. that, that it, these, this is important if you want to have progress in, in your over, if you want to learn things over the long term, you have to be honest about when you were wrong yes. in order yeah. to move forward. Does it work otherwise? Fantastic. I was a huge fan of your work before we talk here. And now, if anything, I'm a bigger fan of your work. <laughs> this has been fantastic. I really enjoyed this. I don't know if you want to mention your books or anything. Otherwise, I've got my, the two ones that, sorry, I'm getting close to the mic here, but my, my biggest, this is the polar bear catastrophe okay. that never happened. Very good. And that's really all got all of the science of the whole polar bear controversy in it. And th that's Excellent. available on Amazon. And then the other one that's doing really well actually is my kid's book. Okay. And it's called Polar Bear Facts and Myths. And it's a skinny little book, but okay. it's mostly pictures. Very good. And it, what I was trying to do was give kids a book that explains polar bear ecology without scaring them to death about with this whole climate change thing saying that they were all going to die because the kids get inundated with that message way way too much but on by all sides and david attenborough comes into that as well in in just hammering that message that kids get at school they get it when they watch tv documentaries and the whole thing even cartoons it's coming up yeah, now yep. so yeah, i just that they want they kids need needed some books that were about polar yeah. bears and that has just facts so that they can actually learn things. And I thought there's one about walruses. All right. Yeah. I think it's just straight up evil to scare little kids for no good reason. They talk about kids not being able to sleep because of this stuff. So I'm very glad that you're fighting back. Thank you. So. Yeah. No, it was a real pleasure to talk to you, Tom. It was great. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll have to do right. this again. We'll Thank look you. Okay. Susan Crockford. Bye.